Good evening, welcome to uh, this latest in the events run by Get Cumbria Buzzing. Um, my name is Steve Trotter and I'm Chief Executive of Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Um, and um, I'm sure a bit like me, you can't wait for spring to arrive so that we can see emerging pollinators in and, in and around. I live up in North Cumbria where it's still cold. So uh, we saw, I've seen one bee in the distance so far. So uh, I think we, can, we none of us can wait until um, spring arrives and things start moving again. Um, but no doubt where you live in warmer climes, things have already started to move. Um, this evening, um, we're hosted, as I say, by Get Cumbria Buzzing, um, which is a Cumbria Local Nature Partnership partnership program, uh, working with eight partners across Cumbria, uh, including Highways England and many of the local authorities, um, and um, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and we hear all the time of uh, studies which document the, the huge declines in insects that, and invertebrates that we're seeing in the, the natural world in recent decades. And it's really depressing, um, whether it's across the world in places like Germany or the tropical rainforests or here at home. And it gets really depressing. So Get Cumbria Buzzing is a really positive program to try to reverse some of those trends um, and to bring back some of the habitats and flowering plants that pollinators need in our landscapes and to take a, a bigger, better, more joined up approach to bringing back flowers and pollinators back into our landscapes. Um, and we've, the, the project's particularly been working on highways and public spaces around the northwest of Cumbria. Um, and we can all do something to help our, our wonderful pollinators, not only for their own sake, which is just as important, but also because they're so important for us. Um, and um, this evening, it's my absolute pleasure uh, and delight to welcome and introduce a friend and internationally re renowned uh, naturalist, artist, author, photographer, and entomologist, uh, Stephen Falk. And Stephen is a passionate advocate for the natural world, uh, and especially insects, um, having written and, uh, illust and or illustrated some of the most classic guidebooks to um, field guides to invertebrates uh, that we have in the UK. One on hoverflies, for example, is very high in my memory, and anybody that's interested in pollinators should have this book on their bookshelves. Um, which is the classic guide to bees, the only guide to bees uh, in the UK. So if you haven't got it, I would recommend it strongly. Um, and Stephen has written um, over 200 reports and publications. Um, uh, and as I say, he's a highly respected expert and field naturalist uh, with many years of experience in, in the UK. And um, I just must add as well, has the most amazing collection of photographs on his Flickr account. So, Again, if nobody, if you haven't discovered this Flickr account and want to look at superb images of uh, UK insects and other things, do have a look at this Flickr site. Uh, just Google it. Um, and so, and, and that's a, a, an, an outstanding resource in my view, which uh, we can all use to help get better at identifying and getting to know our insects and invertebrates. Um, so, uh, the last time I saw Stephen in the flesh was before COVID, about eighteen months ago, up in the North Pennines, where he revealed the broken belted bumblebee to me for the first time at a uh, Bombus soroensis, which is a marvellous experience. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this evening's talk and uh, I'm delighted to introduce Stephen Falk to talk to us. Um, now, just before Stephen starts, um, we will have a session uh, or questions uh, at the end of the talk. So please do post any questions in the chat box, which you can find on the top of your screens. Um, and if you pop your question into there, we'll be able to ask Stephen the, uh, the question later on in the talk. Um, so without further ado, um, it's a delight to hand over to Stephen and uh, to talk to us about the importance of pollinators. So thank you, Stephen. Hello, my name's Stephen Falk. Um, I'm a pollinator expert, and I'm going to give you a talk on understanding and promoting pollinators for the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, and it's linked in with their uh, Get Cumbria Buzzing initiative. So this is quite a long talk. It's one of the most information rich talks that I give. The great thing about um, YouTube is you can stop a slide and you can, you can have can trees and have a look at what I'm saying. So I hope you enjoy it. And here we go. So who am I? You don't have to take all of that in, but um, 
apparently I'm a pollinator expert. I've certainly been looking at them a long time, since childhood. Um, I've ended up um, writing a few books, many papers. I've been to many places, um, um, many parts, many habitats, many parts of Britain, and worked for a good range of organisations. And um, I think the thing to stress though is I'm basically a, an overgrown child. I, I, I just love looking at hoverflies, being in the field. I was out about an hour ago in the local wood, and uh, I was that young child looking at hoverflies again. And, uh, that's why I like to do it. I don't always like to get too academic with deep. I just want to love to go out there and just watch them. So firstly, a definition of what is a pollinator. A pollinator is an organism. In Britain, it's usually a flying insect or abroad. It could be a bird or a bat or very or possum or various other things. But it's an organism that transfers pollen between the flowers of the same species, therefore bringing about fertilization that we call pollination. That allows seed and fruit formation, which is very important for ecosystems, also very important for humans. Bees and hoverflies are the best known pollinators, but they're a tiny proportion of, of, of the 6,000 or so pollinators in the UK. Those pollinators include bees and wasps, various flies, moths, butterflies, various beetles, and certain bugs. Why are pollinators so important? Well, about a third of everything you eat required a pollinator to put it on your plate. And so that means economically they are worth a fortune. Um, many British pollinators are declining, so that's a cause of concern. Um, we know that many wildflowers, many ecosystems require pollination by wild pollinators. And, and there aren't enough honeybees to go around. Honeybees only pollinate about third of our crops. So give some examples there in yellow of things that require pollination by insects. And just remember, you can't have a conquer fight without a pollinator. Okay, some pollinator facts. Over 24,000 species of insects occur on the British list, and about 6,000 of those are flower visitors. Um, that includes 2,000 sorts of wasp, 270 bees, 1,800 flies, and at least 1,500 butterflies and moths, and a few beetles too. And that pie diagram on the right there kind of gives you a uh, a feel for the different species that make up our pollinators. Um, bees and hoverflies are the most important of those, so even though they make up a very small proportion of the pie diagram, they're doing a lot of the actual transportation of the pollen because they're very active and they tend to be quite loyal to flower species and they pick up a lot of pollen on their bodies. It's worth saying the UK honeybee stock only pollinates about one third of our crops, so while pollinators do the rest and for free, and that's important because in some parts of the world, where the environment is very, very um, um, uh, meagre and it's been sort of heavily damaged. There aren't many wild pollinators and there are bits of the parts of the world where they have to do either hand pollination or they literally have to drive honeybees around in lorries to do the pollination of things like almonds and fruit trees. And that's a situation we, we want to avoid in Britain. OK, pollinator declines. It's important we understand the reasons why pollinators have declined, because uh, if we want to fix things, we have to understand the forces that have um, created problems in the past. So if we just concentrate on bees, 23 species of bee have already been lost in about the last 150 years. Another five or six species are critically endangered. Half of our bumblebees have declined substantially. And it's worth saying that bees exhibit some absolutely dreadful individual species declines. And in fact, if you look at that map on the right there, that's the map of the great yellow bumblebee, and there is the great yellow bumblebee below it, a really beautiful bee. If you look at that map, it's full of hollow circles all over England and bits of Wales and Ireland. That's where it used to occur historically. But if you look at the top around the fringes of Scotland, where the solid circles are, that's where the great yellow bumblebee survives today. So it's shown a massive retreat to northern fringes of, of Scotland about a 98% decline. The one in the middle, the short head bumblebee, retreated the other way, it retreated south from most parts of Britain, of England. It ended up at Dungeness in Kent, and everyone thought, oh, it'll, it'll be okay there. Dungeness is a national nature reserve. It's a huge site, but it wasn't. So about 20 years ago, it disappeared. It's now being reintroduced again. And then the one, the saddest story, the one on the left, Coulomb's bumblebee, in fact, that one's mislabeled as Bombus lapidarius, which is the common red tail bumblebee because the, the females look so similar. But Coulomb's bumblebee, um, when we when we found the specimens in museums, we were able to tell they weren't 
the, the red tail bumblebee, we realised it was a special bee of a habitat called sheepwalks. So the sheepwalks were the vast expanses of chalk grassland that used to occur across the North Downs and the Cotswolds and the Chilterns and, and bits of East Anglia. And that was the special habitat of this bee. And as soon as things like uh, the Enclosure Acts came along 200 years ago and the various ways of, of agricultural intensification, those vast tracts of flowery chalk grass and disappeared and the bee went with it. And, and I think what's particularly sad is Coulomb's bumblebee was described new to science from Ipswich in Suffolk. So it's a British bee, but it hasn't been seen in Britain for, I don't know, 70 years. And it's almost fully extinct in, in Europe now. So it's a really sad story. And the reasons for these pollinator declines, well, habitat loss and fragmentation. Some of these insects, they need vast tracts of, of, of suitable habitat. They can't survive in small, isolated sites. There's habitat destruction. And that includes succession, you know, when the scrub and the woodland takes over a grassland or, or a marsh. Neglect, poor management, such as cutting at a bad time of year. Impacts of pollutions, such as waterborne runoff or aerial nitrogen dioxide. And it's worth saying nitrogen dioxide, it's almost, it's almost like the rain has turned into um, a form of fertilizer. Um, and it can it can um, it can it can fertilize the soil. It can cause the flower communities to change um, and then it can affect the insects and, and other wildlife. It's a big problem in places like the Pennines. Also, the low countries, places like the Netherlands, uh, agrochemicals, uh, fertilizers, herbicides and especially neonics, which are, of course, are very controversial at the moment. Right. Disease. And that B in the middle at the bottom there. That is Bombus terrestris. Now we get Bombus terrestris in Britain. It's what we call the butt-tailed bumblebee. Um, and it's flying at the moment in mid-March. You'll notice that one doesn't have a white tail, sorry, a, a buff tail. It has a white tail because it's actually the foreign continental form of the buff tailed bumblebee. And the story there is that for, for quite a long time, people were introducing um, these bees in from Europe. They breed them commercially in Europe. They bring them into Britain for, um, um, greenhouse pollination and they take them to many other parts of the world but they don't just take the bee to other parts of the world they take all its diseases with it and in places like South America the native bumblebees are declining dramatically because of European bombus terrestris and all the diseases it's very much like the story of smallpox being taken taken by the, the conquistadors to South America and of course the populations that they encountered were naive to that disease and had no resistance and that's kind of what's happening with the bumblebees you know the bumblebees of these other places they can't cope with the diseases in the european bumblebees and then of course we have all the climatic factors the, the, the cold springs the wet summers the mild winters the droughts um it's a barrage of attacks on on um, pollinators and it makes life quite challenging for them at the moment oops Sorry about that. Uh, there are also pollinator increases, so it's not all losses, there's gains as well. Um, we've gained 12 new bee species just since 2015 when I did my, um, I wrote my field guide to British bees. Um, some of those species are arriving here because basically Europe is getting warmer and drier and populations of insects are desperately trying to shift themselves north to the climatic optimum. And the ones that can are flying across the um, the English Channel, the North Sea, to try and colonise Britain. So in, in a sense, it's quite exciting because we, we always get excited when we see new insects in Britain. But it is telling a story that's quite worrying. It's a story of climate change. And a recent CEH study by Gary Powney et al. a couple of years ago suggests that we're losing pollinator species more quickly than we're gaining them. So even though we notice the gains, we don't notice the losses and the declines quite as well. But we're, we're losing more than we're gaining. And of course, if Britain continues to get warmer, what's going to happen to all the northern bias species like mountain mason bee, great yellow bumblebee, which which actually need the cooler climates? Because eventually, a bit like the mountain hare or the or the or the dotterel, they'll just they won't be able to survive in Britain anymore. It will just be too dry, too warm for them. And that's a little bit worrying. So. One of the reasons that I do these talks is because there is a big political sort of um, um, support for pollinator action. Uh, in 2014, DEFRA launched the England National Pollinator Strategy, uh, a strategy to protect pollinating insects 
which uh, provides us with food, a call for arms, and big emphasis on citizen science. And it's worth saying that Wales and Scotland and Ireland also have their national pollinator strategies, and they're all worth reading. The Irish one was the last one to be published, and it's a really good one because it kind of learns from all the others. Other useful policy drivers, if you're involved in promoting pollinators, uh, perhaps you work with local government or whatever, it's worth knowing all the other uh, bits of uh, policy that you can wave around in order to create an argument for trying to, trying to gain habitat and argue for, for pollinators. So there's a list of some of the other things you can use, planning documents, NGO guidance, all sorts of things, local green space um, infrastructure strategies, biodiversity strategies and, and such like. It's always worth knowing what's available if you're trying to lobby for these things. OK, so basically we now have a situation where we, we've got lots of local pollinator strategies and projects. Um, some of them like um, uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust making a buzz for the coast. Cumbria Wildlife Trust get Cumbria buzzing. And then you've got also organisations like Bug Life with their bee lines and urban buzz. And there's lots of research, there's lots of surveys, lots of events. So we've got it's very exciting times. It's very exciting to be involved in this in this area of, of work, I must say. OK, so what I'm going to do now is do a whistle stop tour of some of the different groups of pollinators. And as I say, this is a PowerPoint. So you can you can freeze these slides and have a closer look. I can't go into detail because each one of these subjects um, would fill a, a, a slideshow in itself. But just starting on bees, just sort of basic facts. We've got about 270 species in the British Isles. They vary from sort of ant size to really big, 25 millimeters long. In terms of the very uh, ecology, 35 of them are social. That means the females are differentiated into queens and workers. About 80 of them are cuckoos of other bees. And that one in the middle there that looks like a wasp, that's a nomad bee. And what it does is it goes into the nest of a mining bee, lays its eggs, and then its eggs develop in the nest cells of the mining bee. So as I say, we've got about 80 cuckoos. That leaves about 155 solitary species. And of those, about 120 um, species nest in the ground. So sandy footpaths, earth banks and such like. About 70 species nest aerially in bee hotels, old walls, deadwood and such like. In terms of collecting pollen, um, usually it's collected on the hind leg and on what's called a pollen brush or a pollen basket. But if you look on the right there, you can see that bee, a type of mason bee, it's got the pollen underneath the abdomen. And that's something that the mason bees and the leafcutter bees and their relatives do. Um, in terms of what flowers they visit, most British bees visit a variety of flowers, but you've got a few that are specific to just one or two flower types, like maybe scabiuses or, or yellow loose strife, the specialists. Now, th this is where bees can get quite useful. See, one of the things I want to do through this slideshow is to get you to look at the countryside in a slightly different way, a slightly more exciting, dynamic way. And this is where I'm going to start. Here we have an example of a bee, Perkins mining bee. It's double brooded. It has two generations a year. On the left, we have the spring generation that does most of its foraging on things like blackthorn and sallow. And it kind of peaks April. And then on the right, We've got the summer generation that comes out of the nests of the spring generation, and that forages on a totally different habitat, sort of marshy, tall grassland with things like angelica and bramble. Now, the key thing is if you lose the first generation and its foraging habitat, you lose the whole bee. If you lose the second generation and its habitat requirements, you lose the whole bee. The bee can't survive on just a spring generation or a summer generation. It needs both generations to survive. It also nests in a different habitat to where it forages, things like earth banks, sandy footpaths. And there's even a separate habitat requirement because the males do what's called lecking and they need sheltered, sheltered things like um, sheltered hedgerows and such like, because they like to um, do their courtship in very sheltered still air. So you can see that one bee has quite a, a list of, of separate requirements to get through a life cycle. If you have a site, with maybe 60 or 70 or 80 species of bee, if you were to put all those requirements into an Excel spreadsheet, you start to go dizzy. You start to think, oh boy, so many requirements by all those bees. How the hell do we conserve them? In fact, nature is always trying to conserve them. Nature will always try to throw up the, the complex landscapes that the bees need 
we, we, we often stop nature from doing it by the way we farm or the way we manage land. But often if you don't over if you don't farm land too intensively, nature will produce the scrub. It will produce the flowery grasslands. And it's really just being aware of that and allowing nature space to breathe. Um, so, that it's, so it's quite exciting to, to look at that bee in its life cycles. And really, you can almost turn yourself into Google Earth. Think of Google Earth looking down and you see blocks of scrub and you see wet meadows around all the intensive agriculture. And you start to see how the life cycle of that bee fits into what you're seeing in your sort of Google Earth view of the world. And that's a great way of looking at the, uh, uh, looking at the environment. And of course, you look at the landscape level, not just at the site level, which is important because these bees don't recognize legal or, or administrative boundaries. They just know what they know. They know they know what habitats they need. And those habitats may occur at a landscape scale across lots of ownership boundaries. So that's, that's quite an interesting slide there. Just a different way of looking at things. It's a big subject, bees. I've written a book about it. You can get it from Amazon and such like or uh, good bookshops. OK, hoverflies. There's about the same number of hoverflies as bees, about 280. Again, they vary from tiny to pretty big. Many are brilliant mimics. The things I love, the thing I love about hoverflies is they're so ecologically diverse. You know, um, uh, uh, about half of them have larvae that feed on aphids. About 40 of them are associated with deadwood and tree wounds. And there's a, a lovely picture at the top right hand corner there of an old beach with water filled rock holes, which is quite an important habitat for some of these things. Some develop in plants. Some develop in shallow water, some develop in the nest of ants, social wasps and bumblebees. I, t I tell you what's great, though. You can go to an ancient woodland and you know it's ancient woodland from the hoverflies you find there. You can go to ancient peatlands and there's quite a lot of those in Cumbria. And you know it's ancient peatland, not just from the plants, but also from the hoverflies that are there. It's worth saying that some hoverflies are very mobile and very migratory. Some years, most of the hoverflies you see, particularly in suburban areas, have flown in from the continent. So you get these massive movements, particularly if you get a drought on the continent, the hoverflies try to fly north. And they may have one or two generations here and then they might die off again. Um, in terms of the flowers they visit, most of generalist pollinators, they, but they like they like open flowers like um, thistles and umbellifers like hogweed. And uh, they're often very, very numerous. They can be some of the most abundant uh, insects on flowers. That's your hoverflies. And there's two good books on hoverflies, one of which I'm a co-author of, which is hoverflies, which is fairly comprehensive. And then Britain's hoverflies by um, my friend Stuart and Roger. That covers about 70 percent of the species. It's a lovely book. Um, doesn't cover all of them, but it's it, the ones it covers, the ones you're likely to see. It covers very well. OK, other flies. So it's worth saying that representatives of at least other 15 other fly families could be cl classified as significant pollinators. And the thing is, if you look at a flower like angelica or hogweed in the summer and you look without prejudice, you'll notice an awful lot of what's on those flowers are just flies, things that look like house flies or you know, bristly things that don't even have English names. But they're doing an awful lot of the pollinating. Yeah, it includes things like green bottles, blue bottles, flesh flies. The important thing here is just to think about where they're breeding. Some of them are coming out of dung. Some of them are coming out of carrion. Some of them are coming out of wetlands. And you realize that if you have a very diverse landscape, you know, mixed agriculture with grazing stock, little wet areas, ditches and, and sort of the wetlands, um, bits of dead wood and little copses, you're going to get far more of these flies on flowers than you would if it was a very simplified agricultural landscape. So I, I think the real the message here is that, you know, the more diverse the landscape, the more of these flies you get on flowers. And, and, and it's, there is a truth that the more dung there is, the more the more pollination there is. You know, poo means pollinators. It's uh, there's no other better way of putting it, really. Um, and it's, it's worth saying that the, the fact that these insects are breeding in carrion or, or dung, it doesn't affect the, the fruit or the vegetables that, 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 that emerge at the end of the day. It has no impact on their edibility. So don't worry about that. Butterflies and moths. So. All of Britain's 72 butterflies visit flowers and most of our, well, probably about three quarters of our, of our two and a half thousand moths. Um, but we don't really know what the moths are visiting a lot of the time because they do it at night. So it's very hard to see what they're doing. Uh, most of them have caterpillar, you know, the standard uh, caterpillar larvae. Um, and they often require food plants in very specific places. 
So, so even some of the rarest ones actually use very common food plants, but they need the food plants growing in very specific uh, situations, often where it's very warm and sheltered. And that brings us on to the subject of microclimates, because the landscape is full of little hot spots. You know, I was out today in the woodland and there was a it was quite a cold day, but I found a really sheltered, warm bit of the woodland. And it's what we call a hot microclimate. The, the landscape is full of micro microclimates and a lot of caterpillars need those to develop. Um, again, many of the butterflies and moths are migratory. And they come in from the continent, particularly if we get a drought on the continent. I suppose one of the most valuable things about butterflies, because even though there's, there's not many species of butterfly in Britain, they're very good flagships for habitat conditions. So if you get lots of a big variety of blues on grasslands and skippers, it usually means it's quite good quality grassland. If you get a good variety of fritillaries in woodland, it usually means it's a well managed woodland with lots of open open spaces and, and lots of shelter. So that that's part of the value of butterflies is that they're a flagship for habitat quality and health. Wasps and sawflies, again, an, an, a big diverse group. I'm not going to linger on these, but uh, as I said, you know, there's nearly three, perhaps two or three thousand species of wasps that visit flowers and they have very diverse ecologies. Beetles, several hundred of those visit flowers. They're not particularly good at picking up pollen, but they can be quite abundant on flowers. If you think of things like red soldier beetles on, um, on the things like angelica and hogweed, they can be really abundant. And again, they develop in all sorts of places. And finally, bugs. Not many of our bugs visit flowers, but a few of them do. And they can pick up the bit of pollen and they can be weak pollinators. But the thing about weak pollinators, if you have many, many, weak, if you have a superabundance of weak pollinators, that can actually spell up, that can actually make a lot of pollination. Um, you know, so don't write off the weak pollinators because a lot of superabundance of weak pollinators can still be a substantial amount of pollination. So the key messages here, many types of pollinators that visit many types of flowers. The larvae have all sorts of life cycles in all sorts of places. And that's very important about how we manage the landscape. Yet yeah, most critically, the larvae and the adult requirements are often very different. And it's important because all too often we put the emphasis on the needs of the adults. We put flowers out, but we don't create the larval habitats. If you don't create the larval habitats, you won't get the adults. Some adult pollinators, notably bees, have very long foraging periods, which means you need a landscape that has everything from the pussy willow and the blackthorn in the spring right through to the ivy in the autumn and everything in between. And, and, and if you think of a bumblebee colony, um, you know, that colony might be using several kilometers, square kilometers of habitat to get through a life cycle because of the waxing and waning of different flowers. And that brings us on to the sort of uh, concept of habitat mosaics. I've got I've got two great company examples there, Sandscale Hawes on the uh, left and um, Whitbarrow Scar on the right. These are big complex sites um, which serve a lot of pollinators because they've got the life cycle requirements and they've got the flowers and they're very big. So there you go. So, you know, and uh, you'll be aware that uh, one of your one of your residents, James Rebanks, has written a wonderful book. And it's all about, you know, how how he observed the countryside being oversimplified in recent decades about how he wants to turn back the clock. And really, you know, what James is talking about is how can we get more habitat mosaics, more landscape scale mosaics back into the countryside, you know, more sand scale halls, more Whitbarrow scars um, all over Britain, because that's really, you know, it's, it's, as John Lawton said, more, bigger, bigger, better joined up. That's what we're aiming for. OK, so what I'm going to do now and bear in mind, you can freeze these slides. I'm going to do a whistle stop tour of the major habitat types of Britain, just with the key messages. Now, each one of these habitats would easily fill up a slideshow an hour, maybe a, maybe a whole day of, of talking. Um, so I'm just going to really just deal with the real bullet points just to get you thinking, just to get you th viewing these habitats in a slightly different way. So here goes with grassland. The first thing to say, existing old species rich grassland, it's very scarce. You know, there's that figure of 97 percent loss of species rich grassland in, in the last hundred years. So any of that should be retained and enhanced wherever possible. It's a no brainer. Lots of people like to use wildflower seed mixes. Be careful where you use them. If you use them in the wrong place, it's like tree planting in the wrong place. You can do a lot of damage. 
be careful where you put your wildflower seed mixes. Make sure your wildflower seed mixes are appropriate to where you're putting them. And in fact, a lot of people prefer to use green hay because you can use green hay from a local source and you can move it to another place nearby where you know the soil is right for that seed mix. So green hay is even better. Obviously, if you've got a commercial hay crop, you have to take the cuts in July. But if you're cutting grassland that isn't for a hay crop, really try and cut it as late as possible. You know, maybe late summer or early autumn really depends on the nature of the grassland. You know, if it's got things like devil's bit scabies, you don't want to cut it before really mid-September. But a lot of grasslands you can cut probably by early September. If, if you are doing lots of cutting, try to leave some areas uncut, perhaps the edges or perhaps if you've got a, field, a series of fields, perhaps leave one or two of a series of fields uncut. So you've got some structural diversity within your landscape, tussocky grassland, places where insects can overwinter and such like. In terms of grazing, grazing is a very important management tool. But if you graze in the summer or if you graze species rich grasslands in the summer, you can eliminate your flowers. So it's always worth resting a good species rich meadow in, the, in over the summer months to let them flower properly. Um, now, I've, I've mentioned their dandelions, thistles, ragworts. These are plants that are often covered by um, acts such as the, um, um, or what do they call it, the, uh, the injurious weeds act or the ragwort act. I have to say dandelions, creeping thistle, common ragwort are amazing flowers for insects and pollinators. And what I would say is, you know, you don't want to get them, you don't want to let them um, get out of control. But, but you can, you know, if you can tolerate them, the legislation doesn't say you have to eliminate them or eradicate them. It says you have to control them, which that, that means that there are places where you can, where you can tolerate them. But, you know, dandelions in May can be absolutely full of insects. You know, a good a good um, um, stand of, of spear thistle can be absolutely brilliant. Go and look at it without prejudice. Also, common ragwort along road verges and, and in certain habitats. It can be absolutely it can have more insects on it than any other flower in certain weeks of the year. Obviously, you don't want it in a hay crop. That goes without saying. Um, legumes. People often think of legumes as important for pollinators. They are for the bees. Legumes aren't so important for the other pollinators. So just remember that umbellifers such as hogweed and angelica or cow parsley and composites. That includes things like thistles and ragworts and knapweeds. They're also important as well. You need a good mix of different flowers. And often nature will put them there for you. If you if you if you allow a field, an arable margin, nature will allow that nearly always the hogweed will come up, come up eventually. So you don't often have to seed these um, things like arable margins. Often nature will put the stuff there for you. Also, just remember the other little details, the old ant hills, the damp depressions, the ditches, the pools, because these are also very valuable grass and features. Hedges. Hedges are a really important part of the British landscape. Hedge landscapes are quite rare on an international basis. We, we take them for granted. but They're very much re restricted to Britain, the Bocage, bits of the Iberian Peninsula. You know, uh, hedge landscapes, are, you don't see them much in America. Very different type of landscape there. So hedges, they're very important. Important for all sorts of reasons. Firstly, um, they often have lots of blossoming shrubs. They often have what's called a blossom sequence. And uh, I'm talking in mid-March and the cherry plum is now in flower in the, in the hedges. Soon the goat willow will be out, followed by the blackthorn, the wild crab, the field maple, the hawthorn, the gilder rose, and eventually the elder. And of course, that will, that will depend on where you are and also how old your hedge is. Annual hedge trimming is bad for blossom. Try to cut your hedges on a cycle of at least three years because you get more blossom, and also more fruit. Um, it's worth saying that um, if you can allow certain stretches of, of hedge to grow out a bit, that's good as well. A little bit of bl outgrowing blackthorn hedge is fantastic. Hedge trees can be very important. They can they can be quite old, but they can, they can often have um, things like dead heart rot, which is good for, 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 for the, the life cycle. Or they might have blossom. You know, there might be something like cherry or horse chestnut. Hedge banks can be important for nesting bees, things like mining bees. They like the sunny side of a hedge bank because it's nice and well drained and it gets very warm. So if you've got any local hedge banks within the next few weeks, so I'm, it's now mid-March, but in April, the hedge banks could be full of mining bee nesting. So it's worth checking those out. Um, hedge banks are also naturally um, linear flowery features that can, they can complement adjacent habitats. 
hedge ditches can be breeding sites for, for, for various um, larvae that need wetlands. And you get things like fringing bramble or tall herb along a hedge that can be valuable too. Something I haven't really mentioned there is the value of hedges in warming up the landscape. Because if you think of a landscape on a breezy day, your hedges create a windbreak. One side of the hedge can be a lot warmer than the other side, particularly if you think of the sunny side of a hedge, perhaps the east or the south side of the hedge. Um, it gets the sun. It can be sheltered from the prevailing wind or northerly wind and it can get very warm. Literally, you can have a five degree centigrade difference in temperature from one side of a hedge to another. And on a cool spring day, that really does influence where the, where the pollinators are, because the pollinators like to, like to forage in quite warm, sheltered areas. Woodlands. So I think the first thing to say about woodlands is that a fully shaded, closed canopy woodland has pretty limited value for pollinators and of course flowers. So you really want woodland that has quite a lot of structural variety, rides and clearings, even conifer plantations. And I used to do a lot of work for centre parks, which were all sort of, you know, the holiday villages set in massive coniferous blocks. They were really good for, for, for pollinators. I've got some amazing lists out of them. Um, that's because they have really big rise systems and some flowery clearings. Uh, within woodlands, spring blossoming shrubs and trees can be really important. Uh, often you'll have things like goat willow and you'll have wild cherry and rowan and such like. These are really important and not just within the woodland, but also around the edges. If you've got things like hawthorn and blackthorn around the, the edge of a wood, particularly the sunny side of a wood, very, very valuable. If you've got wet woodland, woodland with pools, that those are really valuable breeding sites. And also the wet woodland can have its own set of flowers. Deadwood, overmature trees, and what I call tree wounds, so trees with things like sap runs or rot holes, very, very valuable breeding sites. Coppicing can increase the conditions in a, wood, in a woodland. So if you get a woodland with a good coppice cycle, each, each coppice panel will have slightly different conditions depending how long it is since it was coppiced. And that's very, very important for lots of insects, particularly fritillary butterflies. Because historically, you could often get four species of fritillary butterfly in one wood. All the caterpillars were feeding on violet foliage, but the different species of fritillary tended to use different bits of the coppice cycle. Some of them needed um, violet in very warm, hot um, places on bare ground. Others preferred the violet in slightly semi-shaded areas. And so the coppicing creates that, that, that variety of conditions. And finally, many woods would benefit from wider scalloped rides. So scalloped means when you when you when your ride system um, isn't parallel, but it has lots of sort of um, in, embayments because those embayments, if you get a, a cool, a cool wind, a cool breeze going through a wood, you'll often get in these embayments a slightly warmer temperature. and You get a lot of pollinator activity in the little embayments of a, of a scalloped ride. And of course, the wider a ride is, the more sunshine it traps. So scout rides, um, I'm sure if you put it in Google, you'll find a lot of information from play, people like butterfly conservation. But scout rides creates much better quality woodland for all sorts of wildlife, but particularly pollinators. Here, here we have some key woodland butterflies, wood white, silver wash fritillary, um, purple, head, um, purple emperor, white admiral. And these are all butterflies that benefit from open bits within woodland. If you have dense closed canopy woodland, you won't find them. Road verges and transport corridors. I'm very lucky. I've done an awful lot of survey work along road corridors and places where the public don't normally get, usually with a bright yellow jacket on um, all along the motorway system. I, I, I guess the first thing to say is that road verges and, and, and sort of railway lines, they are de facto wildlife corridors. Often they are the most flowery features in, in intensive agriculture or in uplands. You can go to some of the most remote uplands and all your thistles, all your other flowers, your rose bay willow herb are along the road verges and, and the rest of the uplands are very flower, particularly there's lots of sheep grazing, are very sort of uh, flower poor. So they are very valuable wildlife corridors. If you have something like a deep cutting, um, and it's quite, you know, quite a, a, a broad, deep cutting, a, a, a nice road verge or a railway cutting and a deep um, a railway going through a deep cutting. Those are often very, very substantial wildlife sites and they can be very warm and sunny on the south facing side, which suits what we call thermo thermophilic species, things that need the warmth. 
in fact that picture on the bottom right there you can see how sunny you've got a sunny flowery bit of road verge on the other side it's a bit more shady not quite as warm so but it's worth saying that if you get drought summers the north facing slopes um, on a cutting are cooler and damper and they can keep their flowers later so it's good to have uh, these sort of cuttings you know um, where you have a north and a south face and, and one one area doesn't get as badly affected by droughts as the other side um, if you're cutting things like road verges if it's a broad verge you should try and cut it in a zone fashion obviously the bits nearest the road you have to cut regularly for safety reasons but often you have a lot more latitude with the areas further away from the road and it may be you just cut one zone twice a year and there might be a zone furthest from the road where you only have to cut it every year or every other year maybe you can even allow a bit of scrub encroachment it really depends on the circumstances but it's always good to have road verges where you have a zoned cutting regime um, i put there topsoil is the enemy all too often when you're seeing new road road um, schemes or new road um, construction you see topsoil put on, on on a cutting once you put topsoil on you're very limited as to the quality of the habitat that will generate from that because topsoil tends to be quite fertile and in fact if you look at that slide on the bottom right there um, for whatever reason they never put topsoil there uh, and it goes through what's called lias clay it's the clay they use in the cement industry and it's a really calcareous uh, low, for, low fertility clay and because it never had topsoil it's one of the flowerest road verges you'll ever see vast quantities of um, oxide daisy birds fit trefoil kidney vetch and that's not a seed mixture that's literally what the seed bank has produced naturally and there you go non-essential road verge cutting should be kept as late as possible late august or september if, if it's not needed for safety reasons it's a huge subject i have to say arable farmland another huge subject i mean i think all our stress here is that you know even fairly intensively farmed land can have value for wildlife the the arable margins the hedges the headlands the fallow fields and of course you can have things like ponds and farm ditches a lot of money is put into managing farmland for wildlife environmental stewardship and such like um, and elms and there's an awful lot published on it if you want to uh, there's a really good publication in, in the middle there habitat creation and management for pollinators you can download that online there's a lot you can download on, online as well also the um campaign for the um well, i can't read it there but uh, that, that one on the um published by the Ch championing the farmed environment there which is part of nfu they, they produce a lot as well so there's an awful lot of information online on arable farmland just to stress blossom sequences in farmland hedges got some cherry plum at the top left got some goat willow on the top right got some blackthorn then on the bottom left and then we got hawthorn on the bottom right that is what we call a blossom sequence wherever possible if you can try and improve your blossom sequence try and add species to it so you get rather than perhaps two weeks of blossom you get three months which can be done particularly if you start with cherry plum in late february they can go all the way through to elder and dogwood in june so the more you can do to promote blossom sequences the better very easily done urban areas now these are important because this is where people tend to come into most contact with pollinators it's where you can do an awful lot of uh, community work education work um, and you can have a lot of fun because you don't necessarily have to stick to strict um, um, ecological regimes you, you can you can have fun you can put down a, a pictorial mixture mixture in fact that that picture on the left there that's the middle of Plymouth and someone's put down a, what they call a pictorial mix mixture it's not a, a natural plant community it's just a lot of colorful flowers it's not doing any harm but it is pulling in lots of pollinators so yes yeah, so urban areas a great place to to, to, to um, do community-based projects do citizen science and such like and the, i suppose the big message here is wherever possible wherever there's new development going in it's really important that we try and get biodiversity gain um, you know that we try to create new habitat for the loss of old habitat and it's something a lot of us work very hard to achieve and there's a big debate going on at the moment at, at sort of defra level about you know what what rules what metrics can we use for gaining habitat when we have new development because often new developments is, i know new development can destroy habitat but it also releases the funding to create new habitat and it's something we need to exploit better brownfield sites one of my favorite habitats so this is the land associated with demolition quarrying 
outside storage, transport infrastructure, often very disturbed, often no topsoil, just very disturbed ground. It can be unbelievably flowery. It can be very, very hot because of the bare ground. It's often structurally very diverse. It can have humps and hollows and wet areas and dry areas. And it can have, in fact, it can have superb wetlands. Uh, you know, you think some of your, I bet some of your favorite wetlands in your area are from old quarrying or gravel extraction. So you can get some really good pollinator assemblages. I live in Warwickshire and some of the top um, wildlife sites in Warwickshire are old brownfield sites that have been allowed to, uh, you know, just, you know, develop naturally. Uh, so you can get some really big pollinator assemblages with lots of rare species. Um, of course, sometimes it's viewed as prime development land. Some of it is already nature reserves and it's probably safe from that now. OK, and there's one of the things I'm always very keen to do is to, is to see the, um, the creation of pseudo brownfield land in new green infrastructure, because often that's where, you know, people want to walk their dogs or people or kids want to play on bicycles. They, they, they just want sort of, you know, let's create pseudo brownfield land in new development, you know, land with humps and hollows and places where we, you know, we can just let the weeds come in, the weeds, you know, bramble and scrub and, uh, and you don't have to put topsoil in. Um, I'd love to see more pseudo brownfield habitat creation, you know, deliberate creation of brownfield land for, for wildlife. Wetlands. So these can often be a feature of the other habitats I've mentioned, but I, I guess the, the main thing to say is that, um, you know, they're very important both for the adults and the larvae. They can be very flowery, but they also have all sorts of habit, habitats for, for larval development. On the right there is a rat-tailed maggot. And those ugly creatures turn into beautiful hoverflies. So from maggots, you get these, you know, it's like the ugly duckling. You get these wonderful hoverflies that breed in um, shallow water. So, um, and even quite a young wetland can be good, but it's worth saying if you have ancient wetlands like old um, peatlands, they tend to have very special species and those are quite sacrosanct. You can't replace an ancient wetland. If you destroy an ancient wetland, you, you, you can create a, a new one that looks nice, but it doesn't have the same species. And um, yeah, and it's worth saying even small wetlands can have their value, even even what they call hoverfly lagoons, which are some little little pools you, you can create in your garden. Put hoverflies lagoon into Google and you'll find out all about them. Uh, again, within new developments, you can often link um, new wetlands into sustainable drainage systems, what we call SUDs. So you can actually create biodi you know, biodiverse, wildlife friendly drainage features in new developments like uh, reed beds and other wetlands, flood flood alleviation features. So. It's a big subject. People have written many books on it. Heathlands and uplands. And of course, this is relevant to you in Cumbria. Um, it's worth saying that often often the main flowers you notice in upland areas are the heathers, particularly the ling. Um, but you do need flowers at other times of year as well, because the ling tends to flower in August. What are you, what are you going to have before the, flower, the, the ling's in flowering? Well, that's when things like thistles or clovers or birds with truffles could be important. Um, what else have I said there? Yeah, blossoming shrubs. Often uh, in the spring, you'll get lots of uh, willows um, around wet in wetlands in the in the damper valleys. Those are very important for, for things like queen bumblebees. You'll get things like cats here, and as I say, the clovers in sort of June and July before the heather's flowering. Uh, it's also worth saying that the wet areas on heathlands are very important. The wet heath, the valley mires, the boggy pools, both for breeding and as a source of different flowers. If you've got lowland heathland, the bare sand can be very important for nesting bees and wasps. Even the acid grasslands, even the areas where you haven't got the heathers, what we call acid grassland, can be very flowery. Things like devil's bit scabious and cat's ear can be very, very important for pollinators. There you go. Uh, I guess the thing to stress is that heathland and moorland, moorland management is more than just heather management. Heather and heather is just one of the features that's important in these in these habitats. By the way, if you're wondering what those sites are, the one on the left is High Rig with uh, Blencather in the distance. And the one on the right is just below Helvellyn, between Helvellyn and Glenridding, Glenridding, places I've spent a bit of time at. Very beautiful. Coastal habitats. You've got a bit of good coastal habitat in Cumbria. You've got places like Sandscale Halls. And you've got some, some salt marsh um, in the top of your county. Yeah, it's a very broad category. It, uh, coastal habitat includes cliffs, dunes, salt marsh, coastal grazing marsh, some of our best and richest pollinator sites. Um, 
Cliffs and dunes can support very hot, warm, dry habitats. But you also get wetlands, um, such as cliff seepages, wet dune slacks, coastal grazing marsh with their ditches. You get good wetlands too. Um, yeah, it's, and of course these habitats often, they often occur as massive landscape um, wildlife corridors. They can go on for miles and miles, which is quite important. Often it's best when you have a combination. You get a combination of something like coastal dunes and salt marsh, you get a strong interplay. If you have coastal grazing marsh and, and, and um, sea banks, grassy sea banks, that's a good combination. You get more species if you've got those two combined. So what, what you want, really want in coastal areas is good natural habitat mosaics. But of course, these habitats are under a lot of threat, coastal development, cliff stabilisation, coastal road schemes, and of course, rising sea level and associated storm damage. So finally, we're moving towards the end now. If you want more information on managing habitats for pollinators, there's a lot of it online. Um, when I was at Bug Life, I was at Bug Life for three, three and a half years. I produced four of these sheets. And these can all be downloaded from my research gate site. There's three of the four there. Managing farmland, managing urban areas, managing transport corridors. I can't remember what the final one was. Oh, woodland. But yeah, if you go onto if you go onto Stephen Falk Research Gate, you'll find downloadable copies of these. And some practical things you can do. Be friendly gardening. You can try a bit of recording. Uh, particularly things like bee walks through the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. You can join societies like your local wildlife trust and help them to manage their reserves. You can buy a microscope, just opens up a completely new world. If you're really ambitious, you can establish a new county recording scheme. I don't think anybody, I don't know who uh, is uh, managing all the data for, for Cumbria, <clears throat> certainly for bees. Uh, we could probably do with a county bee um, recorder for Cumbria. That would be a good idea if, you, if you're confident enough. If you're a landowner or a farmer, leave some uncultivated margins and headlands with wildflowers. Learn to tolerate some thistles and ragwort and bramble. Don't cut your hedges too often and try and boost those uh, blossom sequences. Avoid using harmful pesticides when you can. Um, use wildflower seed mixes where appropriate and, and when appropriate. Try and create nesting areas, perhaps bee hotels, bee banks. Read that wonderful book by James Rebanks, English Pastoral, just to get a bigger um, perspective on, on the issue that we're dealing with here, which is about sort of restoring what's been lost in recent years from our countryside. By the way, James doesn't pay me for advertising his book. It's, uh, <laughs> it's fantastic, though. Some organisations worth joining, Bug Life, the Investment Conservation Trust. Just go onto the website, you'll learn a lot more about these organisations. Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Bee wasp and ant recording scheme if you're interested in things like uh, bees and wasps. Various other organisations, butterfly conservation, such like. Some of the identification literature, there's an awful lot of it, but these are some of the best um, things to buy. So just go on to an online book. Well, if you've got a good local bookshop, you can order it. Also, an awful lot of information on my Flickr site. I put an awful lot of time into a, a massive Flickr feature. Uh, you find it by, by if you put Stephen Falk Flickr collections into Google, you'll get exactly where you need to be. And then you basically just keep drilling down and it covers various fly groups, various bee groups. In fact, it is the most comprehensive source of information for bees. It's got all the British species of bee um, because we've added, I think, what was it, 12 species in the last five years. You'll find information on all of them, um, but it covers virtually every British hoverfly, lots of other pollinator groups. You just keep clicking, it just opens up and up, just keeps opening up right down to individual photos. And there are species accounts, that text at the top there. Um, if you click show more, you get a drop down species account. So it's a, a huge resource that covers lots and lots of insect groups and it's free. It's, you know, it works best on a computer, but you can even use it on your phone. There are even phone apps for bumblebees and butterflies. So you just do a search on, you put in the right search words, you know, app bumblebees, app butterflies, you'll find all these downloadable apps. Some of them are good, some of them aren't so good. Those are two great examples there. Um, that I've given. And so a summary at the end of this rather dense, I'm exhausted, I don't know about you guys, but really the summary, promoting pollinators, it's brilliant because it's good for the environment. 
It's good for ecosystem services, so it helps put food on our plates. It produces more attractive green space. You can link it with education and community cohesion. And it makes you view habitats and the landscape and the environment in a different way, a more dynamic, interesting way. And basically, it's fun and inspiring. So I really hope you've enjoyed that. And um, yep, just as I say, you can stop any slide because it's on YouTube. And uh, also, if you go onto my website, uh, www.stephenfork.co.uk, or my ResearchGate site, you'll find lots and lots more information linked to this talk. Thank you very much.